If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 4. Something I've preached on before, but I felt real strong about it. And I want to minister to you on this wise. Tonight, the Spirit of the Lord was praying and told me, he said, that if people will hear you and will obey what we tell them to do, talking about God, not Jesse, that I will break the poverty cycle in people's lives. Poverty is not sent of God. When God created Adam and Eve, you notice this, that everything was, everything they needed was there. Everything they desired was there. Everything they wanted was there. Notice this, God never intended man to work by the sweat of his brow. That the curse caused that. God never intended a woman to be in physical pain when you would have a baby. But the curse did that. Notice that God never intended for a woman to be under a man's foot. But the curse did that. I've had people say, has Kathy ever stood behind you? No, Kathy never stood behind me. Kathy stands beside me. See, I'm a very secure man, which means this. I don't care if a woman can preach. I, I want to hear what she got to say. I want to deal tonight with Jesus' first preaching sermon. I'm going to do a little teaching and preaching. Now, this morning, I was shouting and screaming and preaching in the morning service. Usually, I try to teach in the morning. I wound up preaching in the morning. But I wanted to find out what was the most important thing on Jesus' mind. I, I wanted to know that. So I researched the Bible and began to find out what was the first preaching sermon Jesus ever preached. And it's this sermon here. Luke chapter 4. We're going to start reading with verse 17. Excuse me, verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee and there went out a fame of him through all the regions round about. Notice this. Notice something. When you're full of the power of God, fame will come. Let me tell you something. You've got to be very careful about power. Because, see, God is looking for someone that's superior to power instead of somebody driven by power. The reason why people mess up is some of the ministry scandals of the 80s, the ministry scandals of the 90s, ministry scandal or, or, or political scandals or whatever kind of scandal, usually it's because someone was driven by power instead of being superior to it. Now, Jesus was superior to power. How do you know that? Because he said, I went to the cross. But he let people know he was no wimp. He said, don't you know I can call more than 12 legions of angels to take care of this situation right now? Now, brother, I want to let you know something. If 12 legions of angels would have come at the bidding of Jesus, 20 billion, 400 million men would have bit the dust in one lick. And the world has not known that kind of population because one angel in the Bible knocked down 185,000 men. Don't mess with God's angels. And they're not fat, naked babies. That's an unregenerated mind that paints an angel as some little fat naked baby flying around with a halo on his head. What he needs is clothes on his body. Angels are not fat naked babies. Angels are big. I've seen them and I've talked to them. So notice he returned in the power of the Spirit. And when he did, fame came to him. So remember, you must always be superior to power instead of driven by power. You know, because I'm on television, a lot of people want to know my opinion on something. My opinions mean nothing. God gave me a definition of my opinions. The transitory forms of thought floating on the ocean of life, they change with every wave. <laughs> I may not sound smart, but I'm educated. I just choose to talk like a Cajun. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Transitory forms of thought floating on the ocean of life, they change with every wave. But God's word never changes. So I have a lot of people that say, Brother, the plants, you have an audience. Why don't you speak against this person? Because I wrestle not against flesh and blood. Even if I think that person wrong, that's none of my business. I preach the gospel, which is good news. <laughs> I bring you good news. You know the word gospel is not in the Old Testament? You know that? You can't find the word gospel in the Old Testament at all. Why? Ain't no good news back there. To the Jew, he said, you do this or you die. But to you, to the Gentile, he didn't give you a law. He gave you a way, embodied in an actual personality called the Holy Spirit. If Jesus is the truth, you can't get lost. If Jesus is the life, if Jesus is the life, the devil can't kill you. If Jesus is the way, I mean, you, 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 can't, you, can't, you can't make a mistake. If Jesus is the way, you can't get lost. If he's the truth, you cannot be deceived. If he's the life, the devil can't kill you. That's a sermon in itself right there. See, God gave you the Holy Spirit. To guide you in all truth. He's not a com he is a comforter, but he's not a counselor. 
because he doesn't talk of himself. If you want some counseling, you've got to talk to Jesus. So you've got to find out the job of the Father, the job of the Son, and the job of the Holy Ghost. Now, some people don't believe that. That's okay. They say, well, bless God, we believe in Jesus. Only. Okay, well, I ain't going to fight you. I never fight people doctrinally. Read verse 14 again. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. There went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. Watch this, verse 15. And he taught in the synagogues, being glorified of all. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jesus' first preaching sermon. He's about ready to open up the book and preach his very first sermon. Verse 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and, his cu and as his custom was, stop for a minute. The Lord told me something not too long ago. He said, quit preaching and looking for the obvious in the Bible. Look for things in the Bible that are not obvious. These words in the Bible are not put there just for sentence structure. Every word is anointed and divine revelation fills it. And that statement, and as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for the read. You know what that tells me? Jesus was a churchgoer. Jesus went to church. As his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now, you, can, you gotta understand something. Jesus went to church for 30 years, sat down, and listened to people interpret what he wrote. <laughs> for 30 years. Because everything they read, he wrote. How do you know? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So, if Jesus was a churchgoer, Ephesians 5 1 says, Be ye therefore imitators of God as dear children. So, we must be churchgoers. Because it was his custom. When Jody was little, she used to come up to me, but she'd be eight, nine years old. Dad, how come you go to church all the time? You go to church all the time. Well, bless God, it's my custom. I like to eat. I love the flavors of God's gospel. Even though I am full of the Holy Ghost, even though I preach the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, my God, if I want to really get down to some good praying, I stop at a Catholic church. Why? Got to alter it every few. You want to pray, just sit down, slap her down, and let her rip. You can pray in the Catholic church. They don't want the ones that stay open all night. They got to alter it every pew. Watch that. You can start praying in tongues. Ain't nobody going to stop you. You do that at the Baptist church, they're going to run you off. Nothing wrong with the Baptist. I love it. But I'm saying, my God, if I want to pray, oh, glory! I can't just flat pray. God, you got to alter it at pew. Now, if I want to hear a good salvation, my mean, burning, good, good, clean, pure, punching salvation, I stop at the Baptist church. Them people can preach salvation. Son, if I want to hear something about grace, I go to a Methodist church. Glory to God! Woo! They can preach on grace. Now, if I want some Tabasco sauce, hot pie, back punch, and kick and preach it, I go down to one of them Pentecostal churches. Where they go, glory, yeah, Ooh, Lord. And if I want to dance in the spirit, I go listen to a black choir. Let me tell you, you want a good, good praise and worship team and choir, get the black people. White people have a hard time staying up with black people. See, black people go, doom, now black people go, I mean white people go, the day I passed you on the street and my heart fell at your feet, I can't help it if I'm still in love with you. White people sing, blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a boy. Not black people. Go, do. Bless it. Bless it. Jesus is mine. Now, if you get down close to New Orleans, they go, bless it. Jesus is mine. I just kind of like that flavor. I just like it. I just like it. Hallelujah. We need everybody in the church. As his custom was, verse 16, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for the read, verse 17. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. Notice that. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had found, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18, Jesus' first preaching sermon, you have his notes wrote down for you. Notice when Jesus starts talking in verse 18, everything turns red. Jesus got hot words. Now, what's the first thing you would think Jesus would say? I've come to heal you. I've come here to bless God to get you to my Father. 
what is the most important thing on Jesus' mind? It comes out in his first sermon. His first point is this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, up on me, up on me, up on me. For he hath anointed me. Watch this. To preach the gospel to the poor. First thing that comes out of his mouth, first preaching sermon he ever preaches is, the Spirit of the Lord God's upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel good news to the poor. What's good news to a poor man? Ain't gonna be poor no more. Now you would think that Jesus would say something, I come to heal you and get you out of a wheelchair. But no, he says the number one agenda on God's list is to eradicate poverty. And yet the church world has adopted poverty as something from God when God don't have poverty anywhere. God says poverty is a curse, prosperity is a blessing. Now who are you going to believe? Think about that. If poverty is so wonderful, how come Jesus left? He walking on gold streets tonight. You think he cares if primetime live likes it or not? The first thing, first preaching sermon, first thing is on his mind, poverty. I got to get rid of poverty. But poverty is not a natural problem. That's why you can't eradicate poverty with money. We give billions and billions and billions of dollars every year to other countries to eradicate poverty and they're still poor. Why? Because you can't get rid of poverty until you're anointed to do so. Poverty is not a natural problem. Poverty is a supernatural problem. You get, and thank God that people help people that are poor, but you need to be anointed to preach the gospel good news to the poor. How do you break the poverty cycle? By being anointed to do so. Most people that are helping the poor are not anointed to do so. Thank God that they do. Thank God that they have compassion to help the poor. But the problem is they are still poor. You can give people fish to eat, and that's wonderful. But what you need to do is teach them how to fish so they can have a fishing business and be a blessing to other people as well as being a blessing to themselves. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. The United States government proves every year that money will not eradicate poverty. We gave billions of dollars to Somalia. They're still poor. We give billions and billions of dollars all over the world. They're still poor. We have pumped billions and billions and billions of dollars into Africa. It's still poor. Why? Because the United States government, I'll say it on television, is not anointed to help the poor. Thank God we do help the poor, but to get rid of poverty, you have got to be anointed. Notice Jesus had to be anointed. He had to be anointed. Jesus had to be anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, how do you get rid of poverty? Well, if it's not a natural problem, it's a supernatural problem. You've got to answer with a supernatural answer. What answer is that? Prosperity. They both start with the letter P. Poverty belonged to the devil and prosperity belonged to God. Yet the church world adopted poverty as a blessing. But you notice most people that tell you to be poor, they ain't poor. You ever notice the church tells you to be poor, but they don't want to be poor? Think about it for a minute. The church is always there, well, bless God, you know, don't expect anything in return, except on Sunday morning. They expect you to bless them. My God, you go to churches, they got wonderful churches all over America. Go to the Vatican. You want to see money? Go to the Vatican. Ain't nobody took a vow of poverty down there. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Don't you write me an ugly letter. <laughs> hey, I'm on your side, man. I'm glad the Vatican's beautiful. I'm glad they got wonderful artworks. I'm glad for all that glory that I got. Thank you, Jesus. I don't have a problem with that. Poverty is not fun. Poverty causes all kinds of problems. Why? Because it's a curse. Jesus said through Moses, I put death and life before you. The Lord said, let me give you a hint. Choose life. Choose life. Oh, no, we're not worthy. He had to be anointed to preach the gospel. You would think the first thing that would come out of Jesus' mind would be salvation, right? At least that's what I'd have thought. No. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Look what he did for number two. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now, you think, you know, most churches would say, most people would say, well, bless God, this person's brokenhearted. We've got to help them. But you know, in God's mind, that's number two. That's not as important as getting rid of poverty because he would have put that first, but he didn't. He said, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. You know, I've seen a lot of brokenhearted people in churches. And I said, oh, Lord, I have compassion to reach out and touch them. I said, that's very important to me. He said, it is to me too. But it's not my most important thing on earth. My most important thing on earth is to get rid of poverty. 
to break it. And the only way you're going to do it is to be anointed to do so. I'm going to say something going to shock you. Jesse Duplantis is anointed to break the poverty cycle. <laughs> I know how to do it. Why? Been anointed to preach a good gospel. I know the I know the plan. I understand the operation of sowing and reaping. Well, why does God want you to give? Because that's how He can get something to you. See, He's trying to get something to you, not something from you. He's trying to get it to you. It's Thirty, sixty, and a hundredfold. Some people say I don't believe. You know why some people don't believe in a hundredfold? That's where the chokehold is. See, God can't give you what you can't receive. Some of you people couldn't get saved till you became an adult. I couldn't get saved till I was 24 and a half years old. But you know what? I could have got saved when I was five. I'd have accepted it. My salvation was present. It was there for me, but I couldn't receive it because I didn't want it. You see my point? He has anointed me to preach the gospel. I can say what Jesus said. I am anointed to preach the gospel good news to the poor. But you know what? If you're going to break the poverty cycle, you have to be anointed to do so. You cannot break the poverty cycle with money. You keep giving people money if you don't change their attitude. Ladies and gentlemen, look at this book. This is a welfare book. It's a welfare book. It's been wrote for your welfare. And if you listen to it, you will fare well. It's your book. You just get it. Mind. First thing on Jesus' mind. I've been anointed, Jesse, to preach the gospel to the poor. I've been sent to heal the brokenhearted. So most of the time we always deal with the brokenhearted and leave people in poverty. And God says, get to number one. We get, listen, you get rid of poverty. You, you, you'll find a lot of less people brokenhearted. <laughs> Poverty has caused more brokenheartedness and divorce than you've ever seen in your life. Financial stress and pressure is the worst thing in the world, especially to an American, because we've been taught to be successful. I just come back from preaching in England. You know, they, they don't tell their children in England this. I, they, they, this is not England people don't get mad at me because this is what some of your people told me. We've been told since we're Americans. When, we, when we're growing up in school, what you're going to be when you grow up, you can be anything you want. You want to be president of the United States, you can be president of the United States. You live in the United States of America. There may be a lot of things bad about America, but there are more things good about it because it's a wonderful nation. And you can tell your child, son, you can be anything you want. You work hard, you can be anything you want. You know, they don't tell people that in other countries. You can be hold the highest office in the, in the United States of America as president of the United States, but you can't be a part of the royal family if you're not a Windsor. But you can be president of the United States. You can be speaker of the House. You can be the majority leader of the Senate. You can be, you can be whatever you want in the United States of America. You know why? Because God's anointed this nation and told people they could be anything they want to be. And you know why America's so rich and South America is so poor because when they started South America people went over there looking for gold but when they started North America people came over here looking for God when you come looking for God you're gonna get the gold and that's something what's the difference ain't no difference actually in the nations the difference was is how it started we came for freedom of religion to worship God God said, because you did that, I'll bless you in the city, bless you in the field, bless you going in, and bless you going out. Lord, God, this nation has been blessed. So he, the Spirit of the Lord God's upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, number one. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, number two. Watch this. To preach deliverance to the captives, number three. Now, I would have thought that would have been number one. Somebody in captivity, my God, let's get them out of captivity. Preach deliverance to them. God said, that's important, Jesse. But it's not as important as breaking poverty in their life. It's not as important as healing their broken heart. But if you get rid of their poverty, they won't have a broken heart and they won't be in captivity. Did you see how the devil has bound us and the church world has made it something holy? Isn't that amazing? Adam and Eve were so blessed they didn't need clothes. Do you know they didn't, though they were naked, they were actually shielded. They wore a robe of light. But when they ate of the fruit, now let me show you how God is. God is such a compassionate God. He said, look, I'm going to create this place called Eden. I'm going to put trees in. You can eat as much as you want. Knock yourself out. Fall on the floor with a bloated belly if you want. Eat all you want. You can eat of all the trees. I like to have one tree. Just one tree. Can I, I, I want this, can I have this tree? Yeah, you can have this tree. If you don't mind, this would be my tree. And here's all these other trees. You eat as much as you want. I just want one tree. And guess what tree they wanted? God's tree. It's like tithing. Lord says, I just like a tithe. You keep 90%. I'll I just like to have 10, but I'll give you a hundredfold blessing on your 10%. And people say, no, no, I want that tree. Isn't that amazing? And let me tell you something about your job. It was never designed to pay all your bills. That's why your wife's got to work. 
That's why your kids got to work. That's why you're trying to find a job for your dog. <laughs> it was never intended to pay all your bills. It's been given to you to sow seed. And the harvest, the 30, 60, and 100 fold harvest off your seed will take care of all your bills. If you'd understand that, it's like some people say, I'll tell you one thing, if I made $200,000 a year, then bless God, I can do anything I want. No, you wouldn't. Yeah, if you stayed in that mobile home trailer you're living in, making $200,000 a year, you would. Yeah, you can do anything you want, but you're not going to stay in that mobile home. You're not going to stay in that trailer. You're going to go buy you some big house, kick up your mortgage note to about $9,000 a month, and all of a sudden, $200,000 a year ain't enough to make it. You ain't going to drive a Volkswagen no more. You're going to drive a BMW or a Mercedes or a Rolls Royce. Yeah, if you stayed living where you were, whoo, you can do anything you want that 200000 a year, but you ain't going to do that. You're going to stop. You ain't going to never go to a Kmart. Walmart is something that was in your dreams. <laughs> You're going to Neiman's. You're going to Neiman Market, son. You ain't going to pay less. You want to pay more. <laughs> right? That's a fact. Let me tell you, you ain't going to go in the dress shop. You're going to go in the dress shop that make you sit down. Have your husband sit down because he's going to get the shock of his life when he finds out how much this thing going to cost him. <laughs> Would you like to have something to drink? Usually they offer you wine because you got to get drunk to pay for this thing. <laughs> now, you notice if you go to Kmart, there ain't nobody come ask you to sit down. <laughs> you ever notice that? You go to Walmart. Hey, how you doing? Welcome to Walmart. Ain't nobody come say, now sit down while your wife try on clothes. Uh-uh, ain't going to happen. But you go to Lily Rubin. You go to some fancy dress shop, and the person they say, would you like something to drink? <laughs> that means you're about ready to get hit pretty hard. <laughs> and if you notice something, ladies, they smart, yeah. You know expensive clothes, the sizes are different. Why? Because <laughs> you ain't going to pay no $500 of a dress unless you're in a size 6. <laughs> but if you buy that dress at Walmart, you're in a size 12. Who's right? Walmart. Before you know it, you walk out there, son, I am still in the six. <laughs> Who? That is the biggest six I ever saw in my life. <laughs> but you notice expensive clothes. <laughs> they, 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 they say, get one of them, like you ladies know this, get one of them Nolan Miller suits. You know, they run anywhere from 500, six, 800 bucks a pop. And you can be a nine or eight or 10, and you can fit in a four. And you go around saying, God, yeah, there you well, who look at this. Oh, this is I thought I was fat, but I guess I'm not. <laughs> but if you walk in the Walmart side, oh, where's the size four? Oh, honey, you don't wear a size four. You got to go to the big size, and it's over here. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. They know how to suck you in, man. For the Bible, first thing on Jesus' mind, you know, the Lord, the Lord don't mind where you shop. The world does. The, 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 the world don't want you shopping at Neiman Market. Oh, no, you're supposed to be poor. Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. You know where they get that at? From a scripture where Jesus went to a place to preach the gospel, like, like he would come to Louisville, just like I did, and all the hotels were full, and they couldn't find one room. He doesn't send his staff forward to get it. And he says, he says the, the foxes have holes and uh, dens and all that kind of stuff, but the son of man don't have a place to lay his head. Everybody thought that he didn't have a house. The Bible said he had a house in the book of John. All you got to do is go read where it was. People say, where do you live? He says, come see, I'll show you where I live. Can't you understand that? But see, people, the devil made people pick that up. So he could hold you in bondage. But Jesus' first preaching sermon broke it. He said it in red. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's number one on God's agenda. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That's number two on God's agenda. To preach deliverance to the captives. My God, man. They, now, what is captivity? Well, I'm in captivity, but these cigarettes, but just, just, just can't seem to get rid of them cigarettes. <laughs> you just don't understand. They just pull on me. Well, let me tell you how you quit smoking. Same way you started. What? You're going to have to tell your body to stop because then ain't nobody, no one has ever taken a drag off of a cigarette for the first time and go, son, I'd walk a mile for this camel. Mm -mm. No, no, no. First time you ever took that cigarette, yo. Your body was saying, hey, fool, the matter with you, you want to kill us? But see, you thought it was cool to be Joe Campbell. You thought it was cool. You said, shut up, body, shut up. You go smoke. 
but it, and your body's going green. <coughs> it's cool to smoke. What? I can blow it out and suck it up my nose at the same time. I can do smoke rings. Because it's cool. But your body's going, ah, huh. ah, ah. It's trying to tell you, this will kill you. Read the pack. But you forced your body to take something harmful. You forced your body to create a habit. Now, how do I quit? Well, I want the Lord to take this from me. He don't smoke. <laughs> what are you going to do with your camels to start with? So let me tell you how you quit smoking the same way you started. You say, today, I will not smoke no more. And your body say, give me a cigarette. You will bite a dog and kick a cat. You say, no, you will not smoke. I command you in Jesus' name. Same way with food. Well, we lost a few right there. You're doing all right. He's talking that food stuff. You know food's got a voice. You're in captivity. That chicken leg call you at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know they didn't eat all the pieces of Kentucky fried. Everybody's sleeping. So you're going to sneak to the refrigerator. But what you forget, you get back in bed and you got Kentucky grease all over your face. <laughs> Food's got a voice. I like to eat. Everybody like to eat. Bless God. Who wants to eat healthy? You got to be crazy. <laughs> Butter is wonderful. I told the people in the first last night, I don't eat low fat at all. You know, that's, that stuff don't work. You know, most people eat low fat's fat. I can tell, I walk out the bed, I say, I bet you eat low fat. Yeah, 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 your fat doesn't got real low on you here. <laughs> That's the truth. That low fat stuff don't work. It don't work. It don't work. You notice this? We start eating all this low fat, healthy stuff. Everybody start having heart trouble. Your grandma and your grandpa ate eggs fried in bacon grease every morning. And you couldn't kill them. I tried to kill them. We couldn't kill them. <laughs> It's a miracle of God. I tried to kill my grandma and my grandpa, but they just wouldn't die. We'd like to drove them nuts. But they ate eggs, fried, and bacon, grease, sausage, biscuits. Let me get you hungry. Gravy. I'm talking gravy that you shoot it in your veins. <laughs> Son, I mean, eggs so good you take the bread and you get the yellow and you rub it all over the place. Son, glory to God. Now you eat moose licks. Tree bark and twigs. <laughs> Something that squirrels used to eat. And you're having heart attacks. Why? Because them twigs are getting caught in your arteries. <laughs> Dr. Cherry on TBN is a good friend of mine. I just think he said, I love you, Dr. Cherry. You are blessed. Put me on this camera right here, on that center one, on Kevin's camera. Kevin. <laughs> Dr. Cherry, I just love it. I believe in what Dr. Cherry said. And he wants me to come get a physical. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Glory to God. <laughs> but they check everything. Mm. Praise God. I don't like that when I hear a sound of a glove. Pow! Oh! Time for Jesse to get out of here. I'm going home, son. See ya. <laughs> I, 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 I don't like that. Say, so wait, wait, we have to check your rear end. I did that this morning. It's fine. I have been delivered from that captivity. <laughs> and Dr. Cherry, you know what him and Linda did? The funniest thing ever, I think it's one of the funniest jokes. They sent me a little card. And inside the card, Jody got it, was a, a glove. Pow! <laughs> and there was on the note, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> but I'm wearing steel underwear when I get there, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe you need to eat healthy. Don't misunderstand me. But my God, man, I mean, I find it, it, it don't work at half the time. I'm probably going to have a bunch of people go out tonight and say, I want eggs fried and bacon green. <laughs> it's true. You know, it's amazing. And your grandma and grandpa live 80, 90 years old, and they're still in the old folks' home, eating bacon, grease, and eggs. And you're thinking, will they ever die? Maybe they're just eating good stuff. I don't know. But he said he has 
sent me to preach deliverance to the captives. So you know what? I would think that would be really important on God's agenda, but to the Lord, that was just number three. Watch this, recovery of sight to the blind. Now that's getting into healing and miracles. You would think healing and miracles would be number one on God's agenda. You know, ma'am, I would think if it would be me, this lady in this wheelchair, in my way of thinking, your problem should be the number one problem on God's agenda to get people healed and get out of wheelchair. I mean, right? He made it number four. It's number four. Look, it's number four. Because he thought poverty was worse than that lady in that wheelchair. He thought, bless God, that brokenheartedness was worse than that lady in that wheelchair. He thought that, that deliverance of captivity was worse than that wheelchair. wheelchair. Now he got to your wheelchair. So there is a provision for healing and miracles in your body. Isn't that something? Oh, now, you see, if that was me, I would have made that number one. But not God. Why? He said poverty is the worst curse of a hit man. Broken heart, this is number three. Captivity is number three. Now I'm going to get to your body and heal number four. This is his first preaching sermon. It's in red. Recovery of sight to the blind. And watch this, number five. To set at liberty them that are bruised. That's people that get offended. Tell you one thing, bless God, I ain't going to that church no more. That pastor done preached on tithe. Well, it's in the Bible. Well, it ain't in the New Testament. Now, that's your ignorance going to seed. Uh, that's another message, but I mean, if you say that, I can tell you, you don't know nothing about the Bible. You just heard somebody say that. My Lord, ladies and gentlemen, my God, that's another whole hour. Glory to God, that's just so silly. You know why I believe in tithe? You know why I am a tither? Because the Bible said he would rebuke the devourer for my sake. You know what that means? The devil touched my money, God slapped the fire out of it. Get your hand off of Jesse's money. That's why I'm a tither. And it brings meat in God's house, and I get meat in my house. I ain't a vegetarian. I want some meat. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Yet that's number five. To set at liberty them that are bruised. I've seen people get offended. so easy to get offended. You know, I live above offense. God is my witness. You cannot offend Jesse Duplantis. I didn't say you couldn't hurt my feelings. You can hurt my feelings, but I'll never let that develop to the point of offense. See, I saw that in a Syrophoenician woman. Jesus, she come down and she said, my daughter's hurting. I need some help. Jesus didn't even, he just looked at her and said, and walked off. Now, most people, if you'd come to talk to me and look at, and I look at you and go, you'd say, I'll tell you one thing, I ain't going back that guy's meeting no more. And she said, Lord, help me. He said, woman, I don't give, I don't give meat to the dogs. Now, he didn't call the woman a dog. I'm talking about a while here, you know, your dog. What that meant was, don't you know I'm sent to the Jewish world? And this woman, you know, she said, truth, Lord. Yeah, I may not be Jewish, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Brother, Jesus turned around and said, woman, oh, great is thy faith. And she got her miracle. But you know what that proved to me? Most preachers preach, woman, great is thy faith. But you know what that told me? That woman lived above offense. She could not be offended. Why? Because the answer to her problem was greater than being offended. Can you be offended? <laughs> Don't shout me down when I preach good. <laughs> Thank you for that Holy Ghost growth. Your preacher says something, tell you, oh, bless God, I ain't going down there no more. Oh, you done got in offense. You got offended before you know it, you're in trouble. Yet, you know, Jesus, you would think that would be number one. Well, he made it number five. He said, he said, set them, he said, to set at liberty them that are bruised or brokenhearted or bent, beat, busted. I'll tell you one thing, Lord. You know, it's like one man coming to me one time. He says, now, I don't mean this to sound cruel, so don't pick it up as cruel. He got it. You know, he, he, he said, but Jess, I've been sexually abused. I said, when was the last time you were sexually abused? He said, I was five. I said, man, you're 45. Grow up. And I don't mean that as a bad problem. Now, Mama, I understand that was a terrible thing. But my God, man, you're 45 years old. Grow up. Get beyond it. Is Jesus your Lord? He said, yes. I said, you're lying. Jesus ain't your Lord. Sexual abuse is your Lord. You still got a problem with sexual abuse when Jesus delivered you from that. Now, I don't mean, now some people say that's not compassionate. Yes, that is compassionate. What he was looking for was sympathy. Sympathy will kill you. Don't you ever, when, what happens when you get a sympathy card? Somebody died. Compassion raised you from the dead. I didn't mean to be uh, not compassionate to the man, but my God, son, you're a man, grow up, time to do something. Get beyond those problems. Hey, people still talking about church splits that happened in 1945. Boy, I tell you what, that, you know what that preacher did in 1945? No, and I don't care. He's probably asked God to forgive him in 1946, and it's 1997. Honey, you're going to get beyond that. 
See, that's called living above offense. And the people get offended because you preach the word of God. Don't ever stop. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Well, I don't know what I am. Rub your head. If you find horns, there's a goat amongst us here. <laughs> find out what's going on, glory to God. Do you understand? I know I make people mad on that television. People get mad as hard. He cock. Most people love me, but when you don't like me, they get mad. So some of my staff that read some of these letters, they go, oh, but Jesse, people love you. 99.9% .9 of all people that write us love us. But the ones that don't like you, don't like you at all. <laughs> well, let me, let me tell you what I think about that. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> now, I know that. I'm going to get a bunch of letters from that. Look at Kathy. Oh, God, here we go again. You think I'm going to pet you? I ain't going to pet you. Why? Because if I pet you, and some of you pastors need to quit petting your people, the devil will kill every one of you people. He'll put sickness and disease on them, and you're trying to just help. Why don't you preach the word of God and clothe them with a robe of righteousness and put a sword of the Spirit in their hand and cut the devil's brains out? Cut him and just disembowel the devil, glory to God, with the word of God. I don't need nobody patting me on the back. I need somebody holding my arms up and saying, let's get this battle won. Praise God. The battle may not be your choice, but the outcome is you can win because God said you could. See what I'm saying? My God, get up and do something. Don't we just talk about it? Do it. Kathy wanted to marry me so bad, she asked me. She done something about it. Marry me, boy. I said, yes, dear. <laughs> I know she's thinking, tell the truth, you lying, white-headed dog, you. I asked Kathy to marry, and she said, when, I, when we first started, I said, you want to get married? She said, no. I said, okay. So I didn't ever ask her no more. She know the kind of man I am. And then she wanted me to ask, and I just wouldn't ask her. Now, didn't you say, uh, Jesse, you can ask me to marry me now if you want to. Now, is that asking me to marry you? See, the woman will not receive it. <laughs> It's been 27 years I've been married to this woman, and she's still... <laughs> but women, you know how women are. And that's all I'm going to say about that, Lord God. I got to preach tomorrow, and, and I got to sleep with her tonight. Praise God. I ain't staying in that room with them tuba double beds. Well, I put my suitcase in that room, <laughs> Lord God. Hallelujah. What do you say? I'm saying to set at liberty them that are bruised. See, so don't live in offense. Now, you would think, most people say that about pastor, he does, don't care about me, because he offended. You think that's so important. God said, that's number five. This is Jesus' first preaching sermon. Think about that. This is his notes. Thanks for listening to this powerful message by Jesse Duplantis. Remember to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell in order to be up to date with all things Jesse Duplantis Ministries. For more information, visit our website at jdm.org. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.